actual uh, tumor board that was done by the Saudi Lung Cancer Association uh, for many years. And uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it turned out into a virtual webinar. And uh, we started including other uh, cases beside uh, lung cancer. And basically the objective of this is to discuss uh, uh, patients with special mutations or tumor profile, um, cases that have special features and patients' characteristics that is not the, the usual uh, cases that, you know, that are straightforward. And, and you know, also trying to discuss with the pandemic uh, overshadowing everything, if there's anything that is related to the pandemic, we'll try to bring it into discussion. Um, today, the agenda will be a challenging a case in lung cancer. Um, uh, as they usually, usually, the last Monday of each month will be lung cancer. Uh, Dr. Nafisa Abdul Hafiz will be uh, coordinating and presenting the case. Dr. Suleiman Rajhi will be uh, discussing any imaging finding. Dr. Amna Al Mutrafi will be discussing the pathological finding and its significance. And uh, the, with, the, with her, there will be Dr. Saeed Al Turki who will be discussing, you know, all of you know, Dr. Saeed will be discussing the, mole the molecular and, uh, um, and uh, you know, next-gen sequencing findings and so on. And then uh, Dr. Salim Shiri will be discussing um, the role of radiation therapy. And then uh, we will have uh, our guest uh, speaker, our friend, uh, Dr. Christian Rolfo will be uh, discussing, uh, presenting actually, a presentation about the management of EGFR resistant and non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, I would like you to mark your calendar for the upcoming events. Uh, this uh, webinar is held actually um, twice a month, um, with the lung cancer being the last Monday of the month, and the others are alternating with different diseases. Uh, with the major events coming uh, soon, uh, on October 23rd and 24th, we have our uh, annual Precision Oncology Summit, so save the date and hope to see you there. And then we have a very successful uh, pharmacoeconomic forum that held last year. And actually we uh, came up with almost a, a book almost will be ready next month. We'll be launching the book from the first um, pharmacoeconomic forum. And uh, no, uh, November 6 and 7 will be uh, holding the sec second uh, pharmacoeconomic forum. And we'd like to acknowledge and support uh, and, and the support of Lily for this uh, activity. Without their support, we'll not be able to bring this uh, nice uh, um, activity. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and uh, uh, thank our uh, panelists and our speaker. We'll go ahead and start with uh, the case discussion. Dr. Nafisa, you can, uh, you can present your slides, share your slides and start presenting. We don't see your slides, uh, Dr. Nafisa, nor we hear you. So can you share your screen? Share your presentation, please. Still, we cannot hear you, Dr. Nafisa. Go, go to the presentation and slide up. Go to the first slide, please. Yeah, and unmute yourself too. We cannot hear you.
Dr. Nafisa, we cannot hear you. Okay. Yeah, now, now we can hear you. Okay. Okay. So, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to talk to you today and discuss this case. Um, I'm going to talk about um, um, stage four non small cell lung cancer with uh, unique feature, feature and, and uh, findings. Uh, thank you, Prof. Jazia, for giving me the chance to, to, to present this case today. I think uh, somebody is trying to draw circuits. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. This is working um, now. Go. Uh, just one minute. One minute, Prof. You just put it on slideshow, a slide, a regular it's, slide presentation. It is, yeah, it is in regular slide presentation, but yeah. camera. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, 60 year old lady. Uh, she's a non-smoker initially seen by a um, thoracic surgeon in our hospital. When she presented to them complaining of uh, retrosterior chest pain, the pain was actually mild to moderate. It was not interfering with her uh, daily life activity. Um, there was also hoarseness. Uh, these symptoms were there for one month before presentation and the presentation actually was in November, 2016. Um, there, were, there were no other respiratory symptoms like cough or shortness of breath or dizzy on exertion. Uh, the main complaint was chest pain and hoarseness. There were no uh, neurological symptoms like headache or, or uh, neurotic, any other neurological deficits. Um, her past medical history, she's known to have uh, hyperparathyroidism and she's having osteopenia. Um, no family history of cancer and there's no history of exposure to carcinogen or, uh, or um, uh, she's not known also to have any drug allergy. Clinically on examination, she was having excellent performance status, performance status of one. Her vital signs were stable and um, the clinical examination were essentially normal and all her blood tests were within normal ranges. And she underwent CT scan in November, 2016. And uh, this is her first CT scan. And Dr. Rajshi, kindly if you can comment about, about her CT findings. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a CT scan or uh, with the window, um, window, uh, uh, lung window, and uh, shows uh, as you see a mass seen in the left lower loop. This is the fissure. This is the major. So I have to just one second make. Okay, as you see, this is the mass here. The mass here, okay. This is mass uh, seen in the superior segment of the uh, of the superior segment of the left lower loop, and the same uh, another cut. Uh, the same is is a butting in the uh, fissure, a major fissure, and uh, there is uh, at that time there is uh, no, but there is. Uh, uh, no pleural fusion and uh, no other nodules in other area of the lung. Can you show me the other one? Okay. As I mentioned, it's uh, about 2.5 centimeter by 3 centimeter the mass. And uh, uh, there is uh, was there's no medicinal or higher lymph nodes uh, seen or supracavical lymph nodes. Okay. So she underwent um, CT-guided uh, um, core biopsy from the uh, 
uh, lung lesion, and the, this was the histology from that lesion. Dr. Amna, please comment about the pathology. Good evening, everybody. Here uh, we have uh, a malignant glandular epithelium, uh, as we can see here. Uh, malignant glandular uh, epithelium forming a sinar pattern, uh, positive for CK7 and uh, positive for uh, TTF1. So this is uh, adenocarcinoma, straightforward adenocarcinoma of lung origin. And this is another pathology slide. Yeah, this is one of the mediastinal uh, lymph node. If we go higher to this area, here we have uh, the same uh, malignant arsenide. So this is positive for metastatic uh, disease. So we have invasive lung adenocarcinoma with a uh, focal lipidic and acinar pattern. So to complete the picture, she underwent uh, CT abdomen and pelvis, and there was no evidence of uh, disease in the abdomen. And she underwent also MRI of the brain and PET CT scan. And this is her first PET CT scan in December 16. Okay. Okay, as I mentioned, in the, in the seat, it was uh, no lymph node enlargement, but uh, in the bit scan, we see the lesion again. This is the lesion, and uh, high, has high um, uh, metabolic activity, the lesion that appears segment of the left lower loop. But uh, in the bit scan, we see small lymph nodes, but it is have high activity. This is left hyalur lymph nodes, and this is subcarinal lymph nodes. Also, there is another, uh, there's a brief vascular lymph node, but not in this image. So they have a high activity in the bit scan, uh, but not a large by size criteria in the CT, but it have high activity in the bit scan. And this is the region in the superior segment of the left lower loop. Okay. This is her brain MRI. And uh, in the brain MRI, uh, we do this is with contrast, uh, MRI with contrast. You see the vessels with contrast. This is the vessels, uh, contrast. We see this is a uh, high dense lesion seen in the anterior aspect, lateral anterior aspect of the left cerebellum. This is a uh, uh, high uptake uh, contrast uh, MRI. Uh, most probably rep uh, representing metastasis. Those dot uh, is a uh, is a uh, uh, is a uh, is, uh, is If you go here, I will just draw. This is the mass here. Sorry, this is the nodule metastasis, and this is the metastasis here in the left in the anterior aspect uh, of the left cerebellum. Those. Fezzles, this is the fezzles, and this is fezzle, contrast fezzles. Uh, but this one, this is the region here. This is the region in the uh, and, uh, lateral anterior aspect of the cerebellum, indicating uh, most likely representing metastasis. So, um, yeah. in the past, so, can... So, so, Dr. Nafisa, she was not symptomatic, right, from her brain lesion? Yeah, so this was... no, no, at all. The, the main presentation, the main symptoms were chest pain and hoarseness. So, and we, did the, MRI, we no... did the MRI, just part of the completing the staging. Staging workup, the... yes. 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 So, uh, the, again, in the PET CT scan, there was uptake in the nasopharyngeal area. And this was a little bit suspicious when we discussed the case in the tumor board, there was suggestion to, to get a tissue biopsy from that lesion. So the patient had been referred to ENT, and um, she, the, this lesion, uh, this evid um, area was um, biopsied, and it came as lymphoid tissue, benign tissue. Uh, she also had echocardiogram because of the small bricardia effusion. Again, by the echo, it was small. It was not causing tamponade. And the cardiac MRI actually showed the same finding. Um, uh, there was the, the, the cardio thickening was normal and the ejection fraction was normal as well. So in summary, uh, housewife, non-smoker, 60 year old but has good uh, performance status, uh, was found to have non-small cell lung cancer stage four, uh, stage four because of cerebellar lesion, single lesion actually, and questionable bricardial effusion. We ask actually our uh, interventional radiologist to, and the cardiologist to, to tap this fluid uh, to confirm uh, metastasis, but unfortunately it was very small and, and they, they were not able to do that. 
So uh, stage four, um, good performance status. Um, um, we asked for NGS, um, um, but there was no result till, 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 we see her in the, till we saw her in the clinic. She came to us with this finding, but no NGS um, result. So um, what, what do you think? What will be the fairest approach, management approach or treatment for this patient with such findings and such performance? So I would, so I would I, like to, I would like, you know, to encourage the participants, you know, if they have any questions, any comments to, um, you know, to put it in the comments. And if they are part of the, our tumor boards, the consultant, the, our tumor boards who come, uh, you know, they can also raise their hand and we can advance them to discuss any issue. So as I just want to make sure that I say that. Go ahead, Dr. Nafisa. Yeah. So, so what is your option? Uh, are you going to to send patients for surgery since she's having only two leads and one in the chest and one in the brain or radiation therapy to both areas or start chemotherapy as palliative chemo or immunotherapy combined with uh, chemo or palliative um, care since she's a stage four or you wait till uh, you get the result of NGS. And any, any comment, any participation, any suggestion? Hey, can I comment, Dr. Nafisa? Yes, please. Yes, please, Rob. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so the patient has uh, should be considered as oligometastatic uh, yes. uh, lung cancer, and yes. we have to deal here with this uh, concept in mind. So yes. uh, the brain should be dealt with radiation therapy, probably a stereotactic uh, SPRT is uh, for the for that lesion. And then uh, for the lung should be staged. And I think she's not amenable for surgery because of the subcranial lymph node, if I remember cor correctly. Yes. Or yes. chemo radiation. And then you will uh, wait for the NGS to see oh. how to go after, the, uh, after that uh, 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 radical treatment to the, to the lung lesion. Can I, add, okay. can I ask something? Yes, yeah, please. go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, in, I mean, uh, we did not make sure about the metastinal staging yet, so you cannot, maybe it's TB. Why we assume that the lymph nodes are, are positive? I know that it's, a, it's a, a left lower lesion, and unfortunately, station six or five is positive, and that, I mean, uh, uptake is, is there. But we need to biopsy these in order to say that the patient is not for surgery at all because these lymph nodes, for example, are false negative, TB, which is common in our area, then the patient is still for possibility for brain oligometastasis as well as surgery from the lung point of view. So I think the, the, the next point is you have to make sure about them the standard staging. Yeah, yeah so, uh, actually... Uh, Dr. Nafisa, sorry. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Bamusa, correct? A thoracic surgeon. So I would like, you know, the, and the one spoke before, yes. uh, Prof. Abdel Warith. So I'd like, you know, the, the, uh, our colleagues who speak to introduce themselves so people know who, who's talking and what's the specialty. So, yeah, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Bamusa, you know, when you have a higher stage, stage four, you know, when you decide that this stage four, the... The mediastinal uh, staging take a secondary, secondary, uh, you know, importance, uh, you know, because you already ha decided that the patient has higher stage. Now, if you are going to intervene, uh, you know, let's say we decided to treat them like oligometastatic disease, and you are going to resect the lung primary, then you may have to do proper mediastinal st uh, staging. Actually, um, in the PET CT scan, the primary lesion was hot. But uh, the SUV of the mediastinal lymph node was, was higher than the, the primary lead. -in. Plus, she underwent biopsy also. Uh, Dr. Amna, if you can uh, just remind me if I'm mistaken, correct me if I'm mistaken. There was a biopsy from mediastinal lymph node, and it was positive for metastatic disease. Yes, we have a biopsy from station 7 and station 2 lymph nodes. Both are positive for metastatic adenocarcinoma. Yeah. Well, that was an important information. Yeah. Now, can I ask yeah. another question? Um, 
I thought that the World Cup for the, again, Bamusa, I thought the World Cup for the lung cancer. Uh, this is Dr. Bamusa, this is a lymph node bi uh, tissue biopsy, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why we did the MRI of the brain rather than CT brain? It's not our protocols that we put, am I right? Yeah. I well, the standard I, for, I can... for a staging, lung cancer staging is the brain MRI, not CT scan. But mm -hmm. we are doing CT scan because it's, you, it's easy to get a slot and you can do it, um, you can make it you know, very oh. quicker than MRI, but. Okay, and uh, Doctor, uh, it was CT scan was negative, but it is maybe uh, also uh, false negative, but it is, uh, the MRI is higher sensitive with the contrast. So for that's, 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 uh, that, that's another end of one to prove that MRI is better than, uh, better than. Uh, yeah. So when, when, when you are going because it's, uh, yeah, it is a, because it's a very small legion, and with the contrast, with the MRI contrast is showing. As you see it, uh, we go, if you go back to the MRI, please. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you see this is a legion. Very tiny legion. Very also. tiny legion. It can show this legion again. Here, the legion. Uh, can I have a comment, Dr. Anakis? This is... Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm Prof. Abdul Wallace again. I uh, just saw like, an, uh, 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 like a guide for everybody. If we have a facility for MRI of the brain, we do MRI of the brain. It's much more sensitive in this situation. And uh, as we have this, this case, uh, discussing this case, the, it, it shows lesions that will not be seen by the CT scan. Yeah, so the right. patient too is uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Of course, in the past, it was small cell lung cancer. We do this, but uh, now for small and non-small cell lung cancer, you go for yeah. MRI of the brain. Yeah, so, so in a practical sense, actually, you know, MRI, because many times the MRI is difficult to get scheduled and you know, there's demand on it and takes a while and it's, Hello? Yes, Prof, Hello? we can hear you. We can hear you, Prof. So I don't know what happened. Um, yes, so, yes, okay. So, uh, you know, what, what we can do if, if uh, you know, if you get some, because many times you get quickly CT scan of the brain uh, because the MRI take a while. Uh, and, you know, we just make sure that we get an idea on what's going on. And then if we want to go definitive, definitively, and for those who are in training, if they ask you what is the standard of care for uh, is, is, uh, for uh, imaging of the brain in lung cancer, MRI is is much better than than CT scan. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Nafisa. So, so the case was taken to thoracic uh, thoracic tumor board, and the committee agreed to to do the following. The first um, thing is to. Uh, um, ask for um, um, and follow sorry NGS and then start chemotherapy uh, because the patient if you remember she was having uh, precardiac fusion it was small but we were afraid of disease progression quick progression and, and tamponade and then to to give okay. SRS um, sorry bro okay so go ahead I thought there's a slide did you move your slides yeah I didn't move it okay and okay. the the um, um, our radiation oncologist uh, agreed to go and, and give SRS to single brain lesion. No, you muted. You muted yourself, Nafisa. You muted yourself. You are muted. Uh, Control, can you unmute Dr. Nafisa, please? She's muted. Don, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay.
Okay, now you are unmuted. You can talk to Dr. Nafisa. So I don't oh, know Dr. what happened. Salim, please, I don't know. Dr. Salim, please, can you comment about the SRS of, for the single brain lesion? Thanks, Salim. Dr. Salim. Dr. Salim yes. um, if you don't mind, just go down to the slides, just so we can show the slide of uh, uh, stereotactic surgery. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So it is one slide, Dr. Salim. It's not moving. The slide is not moving. No, it is one slide. It's one slide. Dr. Salim, it is one slide. Yeah, the slide is not moving, Dr. Nafisa. If you just so, go so, Slide, uh, still the slides on treatment options, Dr. Nafisa. Can you refresh your slides? You, oh, we are still... Here I can see, I can see the... Um, uh, reshare, reshare, happened. reshare. There was a glitch and apparently something happened. Reshare your slides. That's what I was asking you. Did you move your slides or not? Because I see yeah, only I treatment options. Of... What go are you ahead. seeing now? Uh, the treatment options, the six options. Can you reshare again? Oh, okay, okay. Can you see it now? No, reshare again. Do you want us, uh, Dr. Nafisa, to do the slide centrally? No, 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 I can do that. I don't know. I have it ready if you want, Doctor. Dr. Nafisa, reshare. Can you reshare the slides again, Dr. Nafisa? Whose who's, uh, who's screen is this? Dr. Nafisa, can you share the slides or should we, should we do it centrally? Uh, Jason, do you have the slides? It seems that Dr. I'm Nafisa... Sharing my slide. I'm sharing my slide. Okay, hey, doctor. It's ready. Okay, let, her, let, her, let her share, let her share it. Try again, Dr. Nafisa. Hello. Okay. Okay, now sharing now. Okay, Dr. Salem, go ahead. Um, okay, so uh, uh, as we see now the trend uh, in non-small cell lung cancer to proceed from whole brain radiotherapy as a traditional uh, treatment towards stereotactic radiosurgery. If you look at the um, uh, left side picture, in the slide, uh, we um, uh, targeted the lesion with um, a high dose of radiation, uh, aiming to spare uh, the critical parts of um, normal uh, cerebellum. Uh, we treated this lesion with a 20 grain single fraction. Um, uh, this is just, I want to highlight a point. Sometimes um, the, the location, the critical location of the disease mandates uh, to um, the initiatives to treat 
upfront instead of waiting. So, uh, and especially in lung disease, if the patient um, is positive for immunotherapy as targeted treatment, we can wait for a small lesions, not in critically located areas, for example, in the frontal areas or small lesions. And this is one of the reasons why we uh, um, went forward to treat this lesion. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay, Dr. Nafisa, let's, let's, okay, next. So, uh, post radiation to receive one cycle of uh, docetaxel carboplatinum. And actually, in January uh, 2017, like after one cycle, uh, we, we received her NDS results. And this is the result. Dr. Said, please, if you can comment about the NDS. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nafisa. We, we have an NGS panel that is 11 gene uh, in size, and we sequence up to 20,000 um, uh, reads, and the reason is to detect ultra-rare mutations. Uh, most of the guidelines genes uh, in the NCCN guideline is covered, ALK, Fusion, ROS1, um, EGFR. And uh, in this case, <clears throat> out of the EGFR mutation, L858R was uh, detected. And uh, we detected this mutation at a level of 2.6 percentage, and it was covered by uh, 1,421 reads. Uh, it's on the low end um, uh, of the mutation. And uh, with the report for every mutation, we list all the treatment targeted therapies uh, according to the NCCN guidelines at that time. Back to you, Dr. Nafisa. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, this result, uh, we see this after one cycle, and we decided, actually, after we discussed the case thoroughly, we decided that since the patient is having targetable mutation, um, it's better to start uh, switch to, uh, to uh, targeted therapy. So just before that, we had like a baseline uh, CT scan before starting AGFR TKI. So this is her CT scan in January 2017. Dr. Rajhi, please. Hi. Uh, uh, as, uh, as before, there is a lesion in the left, uh, superior segment of the left lower loop. I see this is here, the uh, fissure, uh, the oblique fissure, just showing minimal decrease uh, compared to the previous one. And there's no new nodule seen uh, in both sides of the, in both lung. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, January, uh, um, 17, she had been started on erlitinib. Actually, the patient tolerated the treatment very well, and she had only mild uh, skin and skin toxicity. It was grade one, and on and off um, loose bowel motion, it was also graded like grade one. So she received a full dose, 150 milligram per day, and she was maintained on that. And after three months, she had her first uh, CT, uh, restaging CT scan, and showed the following. Following the, yes, yes. Following the CT scan, as you see, there is a marked decrease of the mass in the superior segment of the left lower loop as compared to the previous uh, examination. And uh, they mentioned, because it doesn't show the picture here, the pericardial fusion, but there is, they mentioned there is a resolution of pericardial fusion, but there is significant decrease in the size of the superior segment uh, legion in, uh, of the uh, superior segment of the left lower loop legions. He underwent Although, another CT scan like two months after that, and this was in May 17. Yeah, also further reduction of the of the mass in the left uh, severe segment of the left lower loop. Okay. Okay. So this is a, like CT scan and PET CT scan in uh, September 17. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, there is uh, the activity which was uh, done, uh, which was seen before, it's uh, decreased uh, after the treatment. As you see, there's no high uptake. But it's still the size uh, still there. This is the CT scan shows uh, no significant uh, uh, lesion seen in the superior segment of the left lower loop, and this is in the beta scan. There's no activity. Okay. okay. So she she was very compliant with the treatment, especially um, 
It does not change her quality of life and her performance was uh, always uh, one. And she was tolerating the treatment uh, very well. She used to have regular CT scan uh, every three months and we used to see her with full blood uh, investigation. Um, she, she didn't have any liver toxicity or any uh, side effect apart of, yeah, as I mentioned, grade one or uh, grade one and uh, skin and uh, 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 GI toxicity. So uh, CT scan in uh, um, July 18 again showed imperial decrease in the left lower lobe mass. Um, there was no distant metastasis. Uh, so she was doing well till uh, July uh, 2018. But unfortunately, in August uh, 2018, she presented to our ER with a neurological symptom. She was complaining of severe headache. She had convulsions at home and blurring of vision and vomiting. Uh, clinically, she was um, having subtle edema, but there were no other uh, neurological deficits like weakness or uh, abnormal movement or other neurological deficits. So papilledema edema was the only positive uh, sign, um, but the symptoms were a headache, convulsion, and blaring of vision. She, um, as I mentioned, uh, we saw her in July, and she came uh, with an um, MRI of the brain, and that MRI of the brain did not show any uh, uh, new uh, brain metastasis. And this presentation was in uh, August, like one month, one month from her previous um, MRI. So a new CT scan was done in the ER, and it showed the following. Yeah, this is a CT brain done in 29 uh, of August 2018. At the same time of the symptoms, she came. Uh, as you see here, there is uh, increased um, ventricles bilaterally. Uh, this is the lateral ventricle increase, uh, suggesting uh, hydrocephalus. Okay, uh, and that's why there's no uh, no explanation for this is uh, the hydrocephalus. But uh, this is what uh, they find in the CT, and there is no masses seen in the in the visualized brain. There is no masses or lesion, only hydrocephalus seen. Okay. Um, so to complete uh, the staging uh, workup at that time when she came in with the symptoms of disease progression, she had CT abdomen test and she had, I think, bone scan at that time as well. And all of them were showing absence of distant metastasis and the test there was only the same uh, uh, remaining scar. So team by neurologist started on acetylglomide for the high blood pressure, intracranial pressure, and Kepra for the convulsion. She underwent uh, VP shunt by uh, our neurosurgeon, and um, she had um, 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 cytology was sent for uh, CSF was sent for cytology and microbiology. There was no evidence of any um, uh, bacterial or viral infection in the CSF. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, at this stage, why not MRI? why you did the CT brain. I mean, you already have one at the beginning and it was negative and you did an MRI and it shows a positive yeah. lesion. While in the uh, follow-up, you are yeah. doing a CT scan, which is negative, but again, yeah. it cannot explain why she had these symptoms. Yeah, actually the CT scan, the one that I brought is from the ER. This was the, like an urgent CT scan. And there is M MRI, sorry, I forgot to put it in but it was again negative for uh, distant metastasis. Sorry for that. Okay. There uh, was no the, new the brain most, uh, in, the, in the MRI. Uh, it is a part of uh, uh, a standard of care uh, to go after a, a stereotactic surgery to follow the patient with MRI Q2 monthly if you're not treating the patient with whole brain radiotherapy. If you treated him with whole brain radiotherapy, then you can go with three to four months Q interval and follow up. Thank yeah. you. Can I comment? Yes, please, please. Uh, I'm Prof. Abdelwaris again. Uh, yes, one, such, one thing just uh, drew my attention, the presence of papilledema. This is for my junior colleagues. Uh, papilledema is a late sign of increased intracranial tension. So that was worrisome. And uh, it was just explained by the imaging done in the ER and the, the presence of hydrocephalus, which you probably is like uh, it's obstructing uh, somewhere in the in the in the salvian canal or the, in the third ventricle that caused this lesion and uh, rightly has been done uh, promptly uh, 
neurosurgeon, PP Shanti, this is the treatment to, go to de decompress uh, the, 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 the pressure. Uh, for me, I'll, I'll just continue following with MRI because it can be just like a minimal lesion or microscopic in, in size. We have seen that before, mm -hmm. that causing this lesion, and probably it is on top of the list, it is a malignant uh, obstruction, but it is small to be seen. So I, I will, I will co continue following the patient for this. Go to the slide of the, the fresher diagnosis, Dr. Nafisa. Go, go to the slides of the, yeah. So that's, you know, thank you, Prof. So we are, let's go back to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so, okay. So here, you know, when we have, um, when we have, uh, you know, negative, we said negative for culture, but actually there was malignant cells in the CSF. So this is some type of leptomeningeal disease. And this is very important also teaching point for all our colleagues. Whenever ever you have a neurological symptoms, any neurological symptoms that you cannot explain, it is leptomeningeal disease until proven otherwise. Always try to, so if you, if you did, uh, if you did uh, you know, CSF and you did not find it, then there could be then something else like uh, uh, neural, uh, uh, baroneoplastic syndrome. But always when you have neurological symptoms, whatever it is that doesn't make sense anatomically, or you cannot find an explanation to it by imaging, um, you have to think of uh, leptomeningeal disease. So this patient has actually uh, adenocarcinoma there. The question is, uh, is you, know, you know, and we have here the differential diagnosis. The question here for Dr. Salim, do you think the radiation therapy, without knowing now this malignant cell, does radiation therapy, stereotactic, Cause uh, hydrocephalus is hydrocephalus a complication of uh, radiation therapy? Um, a stereotactic radiosurgery has not been linked to uh, uh, obstructive hydrocephalus um, on um, literature, except of a recent one, which uh, published in 2017. They found that um, um, on multivariate analysis, if you treated a lesion. Uh, in the cerebellum, but with a huge size, more than 2.7 cc, and uh, followed um, briefly, I'm sorry, and briefly has been treated with surgery. And even when they go in univariant analysis, they couldn't find any of these factors associated with the toxicity, except of the patient having surgery before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the incidence was uh, less than 6% if the patient has surgery, or it's close to the fourth ventricle, which is not the case um, uh, in our patient. Okay. So I could, for I the... could. Yeah, Go ahead, Go ahead Dr. Nafisa. I, actually, it was um, um, communicating hydrocephalus. It means there, there was overproduction of CS, CSF and there is um, a problem with the absorption of CSF or one of the differential is also subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, uh, it is not actually due to obstruction. Meningitis was excluded because, as I mentioned, CSF was negative for any uh, uh, bacteria or viral infection. Uh, choroid plexus pap uh, papilloma, this is one of the differential, but definitely this will be seen very clearly by CT scan or MRI. The only thing that, as the Brock mentioned, is leptomeningeal disease. When the patient comes with bizarre symptoms, cannot be ex uh, explained by um, certain findings in the MRI or uh, CT scan definitely isn't that uh, causing like weakness or uh, you know, certain uh, lesion affecting certain area causing uh, definite uh, neurological deficit. So this is where you think of uh, leptomeningeal disease. What confirms that the presence of the um, uh, adenocarcinoma cells, the malignant cells in the CSF fluid. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, this is, can happen in the female, we know that, uh, but um, because of the underlying disease, um, this is unlikely to happen. This is unlikely the scenario in this case. So this is like leptomeningeal disease. Okay, good. That's good. So next, let's move on. So this is a heart CT scan after the VP shunt. Uh, yes, as you see, this is a, a shunt. This is the tip of the shunt. Uh, uh, this will have only one image uh, for this. And this, uh, as you see, there's a decrease of the hydrocephalus compared to the previous CT scan, uh, indicating a, a good shunting at this time. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So September uh, 2018, we saw her in the clinic. Uh, she was much, much better clinically, but her performance status went to three. Actually, it was between three and four. She came on wheelchair. She was not eating. She was cataractic. She was a different person. Um, we used to see a person with uh, performance status one uh, coming uh, without any support, but she was a different person when we saw her. And we start thinking that she might having disease progression and we might not be able to go further and just uh, uh, call it offense sensation to palliative care. So we brought the case to the thoracic, thoracic humor board and the patient had, again, complete uh, staging workup. Again, there was no evidence of uh, disease progression. And this is her CT in uh, December 18. Yes, uh, this is a CT of December 18. As you see, uh, I will show you, uh, this is the legion before. But there's a new legion coming here in the same area of the region. Let's see it here. They start to have a nodule here in the, in the, in the same site of the previous uh, mass. In the same site of the previous mass, there's a new starting nodules in the same site of the previous mass. Okay, this may be adjacent to uh, atlecticis. This thing, uh, just one second. Uh, this, I am sorry. This thing may be just, this area is adjacent atlectasis, which shows no activity in the previous uh, uh, bit scan. But we see now a small uh, nodule here coming in the same site of the la large uh, nodule, which was seen at the beginning in the severe segment of the left lower uh, loop. Uh, uh, and so just, uh, this is the region here. Again, just to draw the region. This is the new legion. If you go back, yeah. Oh, this is the same. This is the bit scan. Yes, this is the region. Okay, and this is the uh, a new region in the bit scan. You see, this is the new active uh, with high metabolic activity, and this is the uh, post maybe of um, post uh, treatment changes or atlectasis adjacent. It was ha has no activity in this uh, bit or the previous bit, but we have now a new activity here. A new activity here. This is the mean is recurrence of a tumor. Okay, thank you. So, so let me yes. tell you this. Uh, you know, some some of you may wonder why we are doing bed scan in somebody with metastatic disease. Actually, we have been for a few years trying to see when we downstage the patients and how to, to convert them into oligometastatic disease. If she had an active lesion when we did the previous bed scan, we would have thought of of uh, uh, you know stereotactic radio surgery. But since it was not active on bed scan. We did not do anything, and um, we continue the same treatment. I think because uh, you know, you know, we resolved the issue. The guidelines what was at that time that if there is oligo progression of a patient on TKI, you try to resolve the issue, uh, you know, with the local therapy, and then you can continue with the same treatment. So at that time, in the initial, uh, you know, uh, when we had the initial. Uh, CNS finding we resolve yeah. the issue with the shunt and we continue with the erlatinib. Yeah. Oh, and, like, now, like... and now we have something a new emerging. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Jazia. Yes. Um, before she developed the uh, symptoms when we have everything was controlled, why not taking that old legions out? I mean, you already have control of the mediastinum, you have all control of the brain. You only have the lesions that to follow up, so yeah. Uh, you know, I you know, if it was active, we would have thought of it, and uh, it was not active in bit scan, so it was dead, uh, dead uh, tissue to, uh, to us. We have done that in the past to tell you the truth, uh, and it turned out to be uh, you know, scar tissue, so uh, there was no indication to do anything for that lesion locally uh, at that time. So, but that's hindsight, we are learning now from this case, and you will see now how things will evolve. Yeah, but if it if it remained positive by a bit scan, I would have done local therapy. 
But we know that we know that lung cancer never come as as one foci. Usually, they have multiple foci in the same loop. And even if you control it without surgery, it will be recurrence in the same loop. We saw it a lot in the same loop. Even sometimes when you do a surgery for a single lesion, you will see that there is another metastasis, a small one within the same loop that have not been picked up by... Yeah, but, but for oligometastatic disease, you are not going to do lipectomy. You know, oligometastatic, you'll do local therapy. The, the, unless, you know, it's really from the beginning, like was, was stage one lung cancer and one brain lesion, then you can do the definitive surgery. You know, so this... this uh, Nevertheless, that was our decision at that time, uh, that, you know, the, the patient doesn't have active disease at that time. It could be scar, and we have patients who survive many years with uh, abnormal CT scan that, you know, will never go back to normal. Okay, so the, the next, what happened then? Yeah. Uh, next uh, I, think, I, I think we were a little bit skeptical regarding the surgical intervention because, again, of uh, the presence of uh, Beccaria fusion. Uh, we don't have biopsy from it, but... Um, um, the sequence is response to treatment and the uh, improvement with the uh, chemo and then disappearance with the Tartiva, targeted therapy, it, it, it shows itself means we have like malignant uh, bricardia fusion. And now what complicates things is the presence of uh, positive um, CSF. Okay, can, can I add something, Dr. Nafis? Please. Yeah, uh, Prof. Abdelwaris again. Uh, would you consider, and this is a question for all the panelists, uh, the biopsy or checking the mutations. Okay, we will do that. Okay. Okay. So okay, let's move on. So what happened next? Okay. So um, the case was again discussed in the tumor board, and the um, the, the, the the new CT findings was consistent with uh, disease progression. So she had disease progression in the first line, KKI. Uh, she uh, she took it almost for uh, more than about uh, two years. And now we have disease progression on the primary, primary lesion, but no disease elsewhere. Uh, the decision was uh, made to do ctDNA to detect uh, T790 mutation. And this is her ctDNA result. Dr. Said. Uh, yes, Prof. Uh, thank you. So uh, the same panel, we used it again, uh, and it showed uh, uh, the same mutation uh, with a very similar um, relative frequency. We did not pick any um, uh, other mutation, resistant mutation, or other synthesizing mutation like the P790 uh, or the exon deletion, 19 deletions. Back to you, Dr. Thank you. So um, again, T, um, uh, again, the same mutation, no uh, presence of T790 mutation. Actually, this is what we're uh, looking for. But uh, in January 19, uh, we decided to start on Zmeritinib. Uh, it is a um, uh, second generation um, uh, KKI, uh, 80 milligram per day. So she received the full dose. Uh, she tolerated the treatment uh, very well. Um, there was no major toxicity. Uh, regarding her um, lab test or um, uh, general condition, her performance actually started to improve. Uh, performance status uh, back to one, and she had first uh, evaluation by CT scan after three months. Month, and that was in March 19. Yeah, uh, as you see in the beta scan, this is the region. There is a uh, 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 beta scan. Okay. Uh, shows uh, increase in the size, but decrease in the uh, activity. There is no activity anymore. See, it's just uh, just increase in the size, but the activity there is no more activity. See, or just very minimal. Okay, but as compared to the beta scan previous, as you see, there is decrease a uh, significant decrease of the activity, but the size of the tumor is increased. That's it. Okay. Uh, and here, actually, when we start to think about local therapy, because now we really have, uh, we do have oligometastatic disease. Um, there was no disease elsewhere, and the brain, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there was no um, new lesion, and the, the shunt uh, uh, improved the um, hydrocephalus. So this is the only active uh, area, uh, which is the left uh, lower lobe lesion. 
So uh, we brought the case in the tumor board, uh, extensive, extensively discussed. And the, uh, our, our colleague in radiation oncology agreed to go ahead and give uh, SRS for, for that reason. But uh, Prof. Jazia insisted to have a tissue biopsy from that lesion at the time of insertion of Ducil. We know that we, we, we had the um, ctDNA and there was no evidence of T790. And um, uh, again, we, we do have um, the EGFR mutation. And that means the, the ctDNA was, was informative. But uh, Prof. Jazia insists to have tissue biopsy at that time since they are going in. So he, he asked to have a, a, new, a tissue biopsy, new one. So uh, at the time of fiducial, she had the biopsy, and this was the result of the second lung biopsy. Dr. Amna, please. Yes, Dr. Anafisa. As we can see here, uh, we have uh, two core uh, of lesional tissue. And from this power, we can appreciate that we have two different components. This one, which is, uh, uh, OK, let me. Okay. Yeah, this one, which is highlighted here, we have a glandular a malignant epithelium, similar to the previous biopsy. But in the other core here, we have a different area, which is more uh, basophilic, more bluish. And uh, I highlighted this area here. We have uh, new plastic cells with a small uh, size with high NC ratio, uh, crushing artifact here at the edge. Uh, with high mitotic and apoptotic activity. Uh, next slide, Dr. Nafisa. Yeah. So this is uh, TTF1. Uh, I have another core. Uh, in this core, I have the two components next to each other. So I did the immunohistochemistry uh, on uh, this core. So this is the TTF1 highlighting both components, the small cell uh, component and the glandular or adenomatous uh, component. This is a CD56. Uh, As we can see from this power, we have uh, a strong positivity in the small uh, cell component, but it is negative in the uh, glandular component. Uh, chromogranin and synaptophysin are positive in the small cell uh, component, but clearly negative in the glandular component. So we have uh, adenocarcinoma with a small cell uh, carcinoma transformation. Uh, BDL1 uh, was uh, negative less than 1%. Uh, percent. Thank you. So the new diagnosis now is the lung adenocarcinoma with the small cell transformation. So um, the tumor board uh, agreed to um, treat uh, the, the patient as having limited um, disease, small cell lung cancer. Definitely before that, she had complete restaging workup and there was no evidence of disease elsewhere, as I mentioned, a part of this lung lesion. So it is limited disease. So um, 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 our friends in radiation oncology agreed to, to go uh, for concurrent chemo radiation. So, and this was uh, exactly what she received. So this is a plan for her radiation therapy. Dr. Salim. Dr. Salim. Um, so um, as we see here, um, we always um, been motivated and keen to provide local therapy uh, to patients once uh, we had once the reason is validated. Um, in this case, uh, if we go back in history, this patient was a non small cell lung cancer adenocarcinoma type. Most of these patients, if they're going to fail, they're going to fail distally more than locally. And 36 of these patients are going to fail in the brain. And this is one of the main reasons why we hold our horses till we get uh, the green light from Prof. Jazia to go in. Uh, the second thing, is um, uh, sometimes uh, there are um, uh, um, a valid point when you treat locally what to cover. Should we go to the pre chemo volume initially, as we know that she had a medicinal disease? All literature when treating uh, uh, small cell lung cancer, they addressed electively 
the nidistine lymph node bilaterally and epsilateral hyaline lymph nodes. If we go with the non small cell uh, cancer squamous type, then we're going to go with a bit avid disease only. Um, eventually, uh, this is why Dr. Nafis emphasized on the point of having the biopsy was a critical move in the management of this patient, which uh, um, um, uh, modify our treatment on deciding with the field we are treating. So we went after the bit positive disease only on last on the uh, on the first bit ct she had and um, uh, the bit ct positive recently uh, so we chased only uh, the progressive disease as you see in the middle slides and we uh, go up to the uh, higher lymph node which was initially positive and we went with a, a, a standard, um, I wouldn't say standard dose, but we went to dose between the small and non-small cell lung cancer. And we went to 60 gray uh, concurrently with chemotherapy. Of course, just to emphasize on the point, we went to, uh, with the pulmonary function test to be sure that the lung function is um, uh, appropriate to proceed with, rad with this radical dose. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sure. Okay. So, as Dr. Sally mentioned, she received, she received uh, cisplatinous of uh, Her treatment was between May uh, 19 and July 19. She received, as Dr. Sally mentioned, 70 uh, gray. She tolerated tol treatment uh, very well. After that, we resumed her zmeritinib uh, uh, treatment, and she was maintained that for, um, actually, we'll see till when. So, um, this is her PET CT scan, actually, in June. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry. Anyway, Doctor. Yes. I wonder. This is the bit scan in uh, January 2020, and they shows uh, there is uh, adrenal metastasis, and uh, okay. she went also for. Um, I think radiation for the adrenal metastasis. This was new. This was not there before. Before uh, the time of uh, diagnosis and uh, in between till January 2020, she was not having any uh, distant metastasis or abdominal metastasis. But this was yeah. first time seen as a direct method in January. January 2020. Yeah, there is hyperactivity of a left adrenal uh, gland, indicating metastasis. Uh, as you see, in just one second. Uh, we do something. This is. Uh, can you back back again to the slide? Yes. This is an uh, adrenal metastasis. Back to slide. Yes. No to the. So, yeah. Yes. So um, actually, the adrenal metastasis yes. we saw for for the first time in October uh, uh, twenty nine um, uh, October nineteen. And it was small, and uh, we asked our interventional radiologist uh, to take a biopsy to confirm uh, distant metastasis, but it was um, um, complicated and difficult to get biopsy. So we opt to observe this in the subsequent CT scan. So the PET CT scan, actually, this is the one that we saw. Um, so this is after like three mo two months uh, follow-up. So the initial um, CT scan, the first CT scan that showed um, adrenal meds was in October 19, and the disease progression in the adrenal gland was very obvious uh, in uh, January 2020. So uh, we asked uh, Dr. Salim and the team to, uh, to give local therapy for uh, that area because, uh, as I mentioned, she was, uh, um, her disease was controlled elsewhere. So the only now active area um, is the, the uh, left adrenal lesion. So this is silent, please. Um, so uh, um, again, after we staged her again with the bit CT, um, it's uh, proved that the disease is only active in one area, which is uh, the left adrenal gland. And for that reason, she still uh, fall in the oligometastic disease, as we all know. So we proceeded with... Um, uh, stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy to the left adrenal lesion. The lesion was amenable and feasible to be treated. We usually um, 
we ask for fidu uh, fiducial marker to be inserted if we want to proceed with a certain technique using saber knife machine. Um, but um, I would say most of the time it's going to be difficult because of the vascularity of the adrenal gland. And um, it was helpful uh, for the biopsy. So we then um, um, withdraw back and proceeded with another technique using um, a LENAC based uh, saber um, without fiducials. We tracked the movement of the patient um, using the spine, and we went with um, a dose of 40 gray in five fractions, completed in February 2020, two years after the stereotactic uh, radiosurgery surgery to the brain. Back to you, Dr. Nafis. Yeah, thank you. So uh, she's um, back to Imertinib immediately, like one or two days after uh, radiation therapy to the adrenal gland. He had another two follow-up images um, for the chest and for the abdomen. And in the chest, there was no evidence of um, disease activity. Um, but there, was, there was only scarring um, at the site of the primary lesion and post-radiation um, uh, changes. And the adrenal, um, the image in the oh. left side, uh, please, Victor, please, Victor, right? I, Yes, so as you see uh, here, the left adrenal gland, there's no activity in this area. It was before high uptake, but there's no activity in the left adrenal gland. And also on the same side of the superior segment, uh, left lower loop, there is no more activity. So uh, there's eradication of the lesion, primary lesion, and the metastasis uh, disease. Okay. okay. Actually, this was the last uh, imaging, uh, was in June. But we saw her after that, we saw her in uh, September, I saw her like two weeks ago, 10 days ago. Um, um, uh, I reviewed the latest CT scan, we reviewed that, and uh, as we saw, there was no evidence of disease in the chest or in the abdomen, and the CNS symptoms were well controlled, and the, the latest imaging of the brain did not show, uh, did not show any new lesion. Um, the toxicity profile was very low, only skin dryness, so uh, only uh, grade one. And um, okay, she, 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 she's, she's actually doing great. Uh, she's tolerated, tolerated the treatment for almost now uh, 20, 21 months, um, uh, reaching uh, two years, PFS of two years. And her next uh, CT scan will be in December, and I hope we will see the same finding. Um, the take home, take home yeah. message from from this. Uh, any question? Any any? Do you need to ask anybody having any question? Let, any suggestion? Okay, any? Let's go ahead, Dr. Nafisa. Uh, go to the okay. take home messages because uh, Dr. Rolf is on online. So what we can do, we can also have listen to the uh, Dr. Uh, Rolf okay. lecture, and then we can have any discussion related to the case later too. Okay. So and we'll this hear also Dr. Rolf. We'll hear also yeah. Dr. Rolf's opinion about the case. Go ahead. So just to want to emphasize that we, we need to have always to have comprehensive uh, molecular uh, tests uh, whenever it is possible, whenever the institution is having that, and to wait the, for the results before you commit your patient to, 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 to certain treatment. But if you cannot do that, you can uh, go ahead and start chemotherapy, but just follow up your NDS result and switch patients whenever uh, um, patients found to have a uh, targetable mutation because this will provide a patient uh, it's more convenient. Uh, tar uh, target therapy is more convenient for the patient, uh, will provide patients with good quality of life. Uh, PFS uh, uh, response rate will be better and sometimes will have uh, survival benefits. The EGFR mut uh, mut mutated disease is a unique subtype uh, and EGFR uh, addiction is always, always there and maintained irrespective of disease progression or uh, ferrous spine therapy. So uh, always the aim of the subsequent therapy at the time of progression is inhibition or um, EGFR uh, blockage. So uh, I don't know, Dr. Said will, will, uh, might be angry from this. Uh, I know liquid biopsy is, is a new era. It is uh, changing the roadmap of uh, lung cancer and the other cancers. And it is actually the first and the easiest test at the time, the ideal test at the time of uh, disease progression. But um, again, the, the tissue biopsy is a gold standard of care. And here in our case, we can see that 
uh, tissue biopsy change the, the uh, detect very aggressive disease at early stages and change the prognosis of the patient. Thank yeah, you. Th th thank you. Uh, great, great job, Dr. Nafisa. Actually, we will hear a bit more about it. Actually, Dr. Said may will like it, whether you told him uh, liquid biopsy <laughs> or tissue biopsy, he will still do the next gen sequencing. Yeah. There are questions about uh, uh, what, will, uh, and this is probably Dr. Salim will be answering it. What is the benefit of local primary uh, control with CCRT in this case? Is it PFS or, or, or overall survival benefit, uh, Dr. Salim? Why we do local therapy for oligometastatic disease? Are you with us, Dr. Salim? Yeah, with you. Yes, yes, Prof. Jazia. Yes, so um, the question no. is what is the benefit of local primary control with the CCRT in this case? With the, is it PFS or overall survival benefit? Um, if we're talking about the oligometastasis, um, um, evidence is still. Um, till now it's evolving and uh, actually established till last year that the, um, when we have oligometastases with a primary control disease, there is a, um, an increase in overall survival and um, progression-free survival, uh, apart from talking about the local primary. So in this case, we had two things, uh, luckily. Uh, the first thing is treating the local disease, the lo local primary disease which we have, which established by evidence that increase in survival, either we go with an unsmall or small uh, cytology. Um, the second thing, the oligometastic disease, we, uh, we uh, chased three, uh, two oligometastic sites, and it's based on evidence that increase in survival overall and progression-free survival. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rolfo, if you please, while you're uploading your slide, the question yeah. is why, why, why we started here on osmeritinib? Okay, I can, I can answer that, and uh, then we'll hear more details about, uh, about this um, management of uh, progressive disease on TKI. So this patient, first, she continued to have the EGFR mutation evidenced by the liquid biopsy, number one. Number two, still the, there was a good disease control overall. And we know that osmeritinib has better CNS penetration and better uh, control of the disease in the brain. Um, and then we did not have um, we did not have the osmeritinib earlier to be then because at that time it became a first line. So I felt you know at that particular time that you know this lady did not get the best standard of care at that particular time, especially with the CNS um, with the CNS presence of disease and continuation of having the EGFR positivity, the, the mutation. Of course, if she has the T790, that will be easy decision. But uh, the question is, would, would I start uh, uh, osmeritinib in, uh, in patient who progressed on erlitinib um, without the T790? Uh, we will probably discuss this with Christian. Uh, but the bottom line for this particular case we feel the disease was very controlled, still have the sensitive mutation, and she has CNS finding, and the emerging evidence of, um, of uh, osmeritinib being a better uh, TKI was all the reasons for us to switch to osmeritinib. Okay, it's my pleasure to have um, uh, the, our friend, uh, Christian Rolfo, who is professor of medicine, director of thoracic oncology, and the director of drug development early clinical trials at. Um, uh, University of Maryland, and you'll be talking about mechanism of resistant, uh, resistance in EGFR mutation. Uh, Christian? Thank you, Professor Jacia, and thank you for the nice case uh, that uh, Dr. Nafisa was presented. And uh, that's are my uh, discussions. So obviously when we are talking about resistance, we don't need to forget the good achievement that we was having with the EGFR TKI in the first line, in first generation sequencing, second uh, um, generation TKI as well, like erlotinib and jafitinib. And finally, <clears throat> the idea that we have in some cases when we don't have still the opportunity to treat the patients with a third generation like osimertinib was the possibility to do the uh, rechallenge between some of them with the T79M was negative, and that was the second line uh, of fatigue. But we know that the osimertinib is a standard of care with an uh, impact in the overall survival. That's are the last data that we have from the final analysis of overall survival, and it's really impacting 
uh, the quality, not only the quality of life of our patients, the progression of survival, but also, as we can see, the overall survival. So uh, one of the things that we need to uh, be, be also aware of that we are not only focusing the driver, but also in the passengers right now, when we are looking for different mutations. And uh, in the very beginning, when we have, for example, patients who have uh, commutations like TP53 with EGFR, even that is applicable to ALK or ROS, these patients have a uh, bad prognosis or, or we need to be a little bit careful uh, to treat these patients or in the follow-up. That doesn't mean they will not respond, but we need to make sure that these patients are continuing to responding and uh, liquid biopsy is also a, a very good tool for, for the real-time monitoring of these patients. Uh, obviously, that is a problem when we have uh, good sensitive methods uh, like uh, clonal hematopoiesis because we are looking at uh, mutations like TP53 or even Karas. Karas now is a major problem because it's on target. Uh, that is just an open a parenthesis about the commutations because in mechanism of resistance, we are looking for different clones of the disease. And you can see here, there are different opportunities to uh, not only uh, to, to discover that, but also to treat according, tailoring the, the, the treatment according to the mechanism of resistance. So in a tissue rebiopsy, and this was the case of this, uh, of this case, uh, in first line, for example, there are the majority and that was published in 2020, uh, this year in clinical cancer research, and no mechanism first line are 59%. Uh, majority of the patients are off target. We know that majority of the patients have a meta amplification when we are treating in first line. Uh, we have new mutations like uh, 797S, and obviously in second line and later, like in the case of this patient, there are uh, on target and, uh, and also off target, but also the transformation like it's also here present. We are not only speaking about the transformation to a small cell, but also we can have a squamous or pleomorphic, in some cases, transformation that is important to know. Obviously here, uh, meta amplification is a little bit higher. In, in the flower study, they speak about 15%. Uh, in, ta uh, in this mutation, 787S, is also an important number of patients, and unfortunately, this is an unmet medical need. In uh, rebiopsy was a concept that we introduced several years ago with the EGFR, and now it's applicable to other tumor types. In 2018, we published the liquid biopsy uh, statement paper, and we recommended at that moment to go for a second line TKI um, when the patients are progressing to do liquid biopsy at that moment to understand if it's some mechanism of resistance there or not. Actually, when we are using liquid biopsy in these patients, and that are the study of the flora, the analysis of the liquid biopsy, you see that the mechanisms of resistance are 15% meta amplification. And there are other less common like R2 amplifications, like BRAF mutations, like ARAS mutations, and also some other uh, pathway uh, change like ALK, for example. So it's important that we use also uh, liquid biopsy for this. And, and you can see here there are in the Osimertin resistance series that was published this year in JCO, all the trials that were uh, using osimertinib and they have resistance. There are different proportions, but the common ones are 797 met, some fusions, and you see also, like in your case, the small cell lung cancer transformation that is present in some of the series. So the heterogeneous mechanism of resistance of EGFR TKI, specifically of the third generation of osimertinib, are including obviously target and off targets. And uh, in the case of the MET, that we say that is very important, that is very common that we have or, or MET amplifications or MET mutations. We don't need to, re to forget that MET is also a target in C, that we have patients that are having uh, the MET exon 14 skipping mutations or the MET amplifications. MET as a co-driver also could be, in the case of the third generation TKI, MET amplification 3%. T79M positive, unmet positive, 3%, but also in some cases we have small cell transformation with CMET or with T79M. 
and that is the acquirer system that we was discussing right now. This is a case of one of my patients that we was treating in the very beginning, like, like your patient with a, a first generation TKI. She developed T17IM, like you can see here, and she continued to have the a common mutation in the exome 21. We start with uh, osimertinib. At that moment, she have an, a metamplification by liquid biopsy that was confirmed in tissue, but the copy number gain or the, also the ratio was not so high to uh, consider that a target at that moment in 2018. So she start to have an, a response. You see here there is a decrease. any of the trials that we have at this moment or the drug that was recently approved for MET. So she was in a good uh, combination therapy in a good response for several months since February to September. And then she finally progressed uh, around December uh, with another, without mechanism of resistance. So this is what we call resistant emerging from, um, from pre-existing mutations and that is also uh, the case that we have uh, in, in your patient with T17IM. But there are also some possibilities that you have in the novel mutations, like could be, for example, 797S. In the case of the MET, we are treating now patients, and that the first data that we have was uh, some years ago with the osimertinib and sabolitinib, that are uh, sabolitinib is a, a MET inhibitor. Uh, this trial was very positive. Unfortunately, it was a little bit toxic, but there are some uh, cases like this one that was uh, already presented in 2017 with a good response. So if you see the, uh, the data published finally in 2020, there is an, a good response rate in the different scenarios with EGFR uh, positive with MED uh, or T17IM positive or negative. So this is a very interesting combination with impact, obviously, in the progression-free survival. And there are also new drugs like this uh, anti-EGFR CMET that uh, it was recently designed by FDA for because they are covering also the Exxon 20. There are two studies that we are participating. This is the uh, Savannah trial that is using also simertinib and sabolitinib with the doses that uh, were recommended for the phase uh, two and, and finally the result that we have from published in, in uh, that I show you right now, that was, this is the trial that we are including now patients. The idea is patients who have EGFR mutation, met driven central fish or immunostochemistry or local NGS, and that they obviously progress it to osimertinib and the second trial is the addition to this duplet of sabolitinib and osimertinib, uh, and also uh, durvalumab using in different combinations or in different scenarios. In the case of the meta amplification will be the same, but there are also the possibility to treat patients with 797 combining osimertinib and gefitinib. We can discuss why is this. Uh, in the case of EGF, of nesitumumab, and in the case that their patients are not matched, we can have carboplatinum in com and permetrexate in combinations with durvalumab and mantanase with durvalumab, permetrexate, or osimertinib, nesitumumab, or feeder treatments that are by a market not matched. So it's a very interesting uh, trial, the ORCHAT. And finally, we arrive to the case like you have, this is the uh, transformation. Uh, transformation is something that is uh, happening uh, in this series, for example, published in this year. 15% of the patients can have a transformation. In, the, in this series, in this cohort of patients, majority have an uh, squamous or a small cell transformation, but there is also the possibility to have an, a pleomorphic transformation. So this uh, transformation is something that we need to be aware that this happened. The overall survival 
of these patients is obviously impacted. Uh, it's different, seems to be different to the small cell lung cancer traditional. So there is, uh, um, there is also, uh, this is the average, your case was uh, much more early, but the average was 17.8 months after the diagnosis. And it's characterized, and this is important, for some genes that are common appear in, in small cell lung cancer like retinoblastoma 1, uh, TB53, or PI3 kinase mutations. Uh, and that is important because in liquid biopsy, we can follow this. If you have a patient that is not having these alterations and became positive for some of these, specifically retinoblastoma 1, could be an uh, indirect uh, in, uh, indication that that is happened. Obviously, we will need to have the biopsy, but this is an important uh, indication. Uh, response to platinum taxano is frequent, but the checkpoint inhibitor, there is not a still a uh, good um, data for that. Uh, I will show you some cases similar to your case. This was published this, this year. Also, patient treated with jafitinib after seven months, after 15 months, having a progression of the disease, and they have their T17 IM. They change for, uh, at that moment, caroplatinum permetrexid, and then, I don't know why they did that, but then he received osimertinib, and in very short time, two months, developed the mutate, this uh, alteration. So it was very short time, like in your case as well. Uh, and then they continue with platinum, as, mm, platinum etoposide, but in this case, that have not, or harboring not the mutation of EGFR later on. This other case is a patient who was also having a dramatic response. It is a uh, Chinese uh, treatment. Uh, was the combination of the ter uh, teriprulumab, that is an anti-PDL1, with an, a new anti-multigenase uh, inhibitor that is covering also EGFR, that is called alotimib, that is, a, is in, uh, from China, is not approved in the United States. And this combination was in, patient, in a patient with EGFR uh, mutated lung cancer also, having a concurrent chemo radiation, and later on she developed again the EGFR mutation and was treated with. Uh, this is another case also, very short time of progression between the osimertinib and the transformation from February to April with uh, new lesions and then became also resistant and the mechanism of resistance was also EGFR uh, transformation to a small cell lung cancer. So I told you that liquid biopsy is an important tool for this. This is the case, for example, in, in the beginning I told you if you have no retinoblastoma and you uh, start to see that in the liquid, that could be an uh, indirect transformation in this uh, indicator of the transformation, but also in case that you have it and you lose, that could predict the small cell lung cancer transformation. Like in this case, when you have an uh, sorry, a TP53 and a retinoblastoma that during the, during the period of this, the disease is disappearing, that could be an indicator of the small cell lung cancer. And you see that there are some mutations that are common, like P50, uh, PA3 kinase, uh, that could be also indica in, uh, an indicator of a, a small cell lung cancer transformation. This phenomenon is not only uh, present in uh, EGFR. The small cell lung cancer transformation was seen also in immunocheckpoints inhibitors resistance. This was recently published by the uh, Journal of Immunotherapy Cancer and Cancer. Uh, and you see this patient treated with caroplatinum gencytabine with a small cell lung cancer, following by second line nivolumab with 47 cycles, and finally having a progression of nivolumab and was in a, uh, like, like the pathologist was also uh, describing synaptophysin positive. And you see here, uh, caroplatinum etoposide was used for four cycles, was in a progression, and then there, is, there was confirmation of a small cell lung cancer uh, in the same patient. So it was only one transformation that you see there. Another mechanism of resistance that we was not discussing in this case is the 797S, that is unfortunately an, a, a medical need problem because uh, we don't have a trial or we don't have drugs for that. There is a new compound that is 
from Blueprint, that is the, a comp the company who is involved in the uh, cell per in the paral setting. Uh, this company is having an, a, a drug that is in uh, planning to be studied in different scenarios. It's important to know when we don't have T79M, the possibility to respond to uh, erlotinib or uh, gefitinib for 797S is present. Why? Because they are occupying different parts in the gay K permutation. And you see here, when the is in trans or in cis, the, the T790M in comparison with 797S, you can have an, a possibility to respond or not. So this is the case of a patient that have an uh, osimertinib resistance, develop uh, a 797S mutation without T790M. I have a patient currently that is in the same situation. We started erlotinib and she's responding like in this case, but obviously we are pushing against some mechanisms of resistance that were more frequent with egfr TKI in first generation, and that's happened in this patient. T17IM was coming again there or was appear as a mechanism of resistance for first generation TKI. So when we are doing the, we are tailoring the treatment, obviously we need to remember that the mechanism of resistance that is involved, we can use one or other uh, drug I told you in case that we have 797S without T790M, uh, EGFR TKIs for first generations are able to, to work. It's not the case when we have the T79M and the uh, 797S uh, together. That's the, that is the, uh, a little bit the same uh, demonstration in the therapeutic opportunities. In the beginning, we was having also the opportunity to treat 797S in some trials with cetuximab, there are some trials also ongoing uh, in combination, but the possibility to treat with uh, first uh, generation, we will say first because second generation is less active, is a good opportunity. And that's is the, the same that what we are doing now. We don't know obviously how many cases are with these uh, scenarios, but it's a good opportunity. So message for this is it's important to detect the mechanism of resistance like you did in time. Uh, the liquid biopsy and the rebiopsy are important. So I will uh, partially disagree with <laughs> Dr. Nafisa saying that in the, it's not really important liquid, but I think in this case it's important as well because if you have some commutations that indirectly can tell you that there is this transformation, it's uh, possible to, to have an uh, utilization of liquid biopsy. The new drugs and combinations is also important. And the most important is that we need to test our patients. So I will invite you for two events that we have. One is uh, next week, uh, the liquid biopsy hot topic from ILCLC and the liquid biopsy uh, virtual meeting from the International Society of Liquid Biopsy that will be on October 30 and is free, uh, free registration. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christian, for a very nice overview um, for this uh, um, case and, you know, the, what we encounter in the EGFR uh, uh, resistance mechanism and how we manage them. So, you know, do you think, you know, probably for many of the cases we should do really both uh, liquid biopsy and tissue biopsy? When, when do you feel that the tissue biopsy is a must? Uh, you know, because we have patients, as you said, you know, I have patients who had, when we do the tissue biopsy, actually the tissue biopsy re represent only what you get from the tissue. The liquid biopsy may present actually the heterogeneity of the tumor yeah. more. I have in some, in some patients, I have three mutation, for example, in the liquid biopsy. I have um, the sensitive and the T790 and I have the S797. Uh, the and in the in the tissue biopsy, I had only the the T seven ninety mutation. So, so when do you think we must do a tissue biopsy? I think tissue biopsy is important, and also the problem that we have in lung cancer is that we don't have never tissue enough. That is the first things that we have. No, so if you have a very important quantity of tissue from the very beginning, and you are doing next generation sequencing from there, that's perfect. There is no necessary necessity to do liquid biopsy. I think that liquid biopsy, and I am one of that that is pushing the concept of 
liquid biopsy first. I think that liquid biopsy, when you have tissue, is an ideal complement for catch what you just mentioned, the clonality of the disease, the heterogeneity of the disease, and also the commutations that you are sometimes you are not seeing also in the tissue. Because like I explained to my patient, it's like have a piece of cake. You are taking this piece of cake, maybe we are catching one part of the flavor of the, the, the cake, but you are not catching the complete uh, uh, flavors that could be involved in a cake. So that is important that we are uh, having the concept that this liquid biopsy is proposing a major overview of the disease. And obviously, it's important for me to have that from the very beginning, because if I want to real-time monitor in the patients, I need to know what was before I started the treatment. So in my institution, what I am doing, I'm doing complementary liquid and tissue biopsy. Uh, sometimes you will be surprised because there are patients that are not shitters, obviously. There are patients that you don't have any alterations. I just have an, a 21 years old a patient with a dramatic lung cancer and she having the liquid biopsy because you know, liquid biopsy is very short in time to, to get the results and we want to to get the, start the treatment quickly. She have no mutations, no alterations in the liquid biopsy. And when we get the next generation sequences, she was on a ROS1 positive. Right? We confirm it again and was there. So, uh, but the idea that we can follow the patients and catch the heterogeneity, I think is the most important points that we can have from liquid biopsy. Okay, great, thank you. Does anybody, any of the panelists has any question or uh, or comments. Um, I think there are a few questions, bro. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I think there are a few questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, the first question was about the role of erlitinib in small cell lung cancer. I'm not sure if the question, this question is related to our case or not, but um, it was transformation to small cell. It was not small cells to start with. It was not a small cell with EGFR mutation. And then in the middle of the treatment and disease progression, she was found to have a, um, small cells. So the, treat, the, the initial uh, therapy was given for non-small, not for small cells. Yeah. And then, and then uh, the question is about, you know, patients having a malignant cell in the CSF and do yes. I, yes. should we do anything about that? You know, I think the, the fact that, you know, um, you know, we used to do in the past, we, we give intrathecal uh, chemotherapy and so on, but lately we are not doing that, uh, you, know, you know, frequently, especially this patient who did not have symptoms, and we felt osmolotinib may, may clear the, the CNS condition. Leptomeningeal disease is very difficult to treat, uh, you know, generally. So I don't know, what, what is your, um, and you know, what you know now about the data from ISMO about osmolotinib, uh, in the CNS uh, activity. Yeah. So what do you think, uh, Christian? No, I think uh, that this is a, a very interesting topic. We, we was not, uh, I think, in, in lung cancer, um, able to have a good response until the TKI third generation arrived. So uh, even a lot of have some, have some activity in the brain, obviously, but the major activity and the, and the idea that we are able also to uh, decrease the cumulative incidence of uh, new lesions in the, in the brain is very important. Regarding to the uh, CFS, uh, I, uh, CF, uh, CF, uh, I think that we are able to have in the liquor a lot of uh, information. And actually, there are new um, liquid biopsy concepts coming from there, taking in consideration that the liquor uh, is very rich in, uh, in DNA and is very pure compared with the blood. So uh, we can apply next generation sequencing perfectly. Uh, and there are some studies that are running, I know in Memorial they are working on that. Uh, so that is something that we can discuss also with your uh, guys there for the next generation. Yeah, I think, I think Dr. Said can do that. I mean, I'll let Dr. Said yeah. comment on that, but I think he can do uh, the next gen sequencing on any liquid. Dr. Said, can you uh, can you hear us? Can you comment on our ability of doing uh, the next gen sequencing on any liquid? Hi, Said. <laughs> uh, hi, Dr. Cristiano. So uh, your question is on any kind of li if uh, of liquid uh, biopsies yeah, like or the, like the CSF, for example, or pleural diffusion or something like uh, this. You know what 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 is our ability of doing the liquid uh, yeah, next gen sequencing or PCR on 
fluid, especially the CSF in this case, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is a reasonably well-established protocols and uh, all we need is uh, <clears throat> the confirmation from the clinical side that they will provide us these samples. Uh, the only trick would be the extraction of enough uh, circulating tumor DNA. But uh, I, I think um, it's, um, it's a matter of uh, just a validation and the quick uh, testing and it will be um, part of the clinical settings. Yeah, it's actually, you can use the extract tubes are perfectly and, and you can use whatever of the platform that you have, for example, Illumina or Thermo Fisher as well. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure you will have much more cancer cells than what you'll have in the blood when you get it when you get it from the CSF right. or the pleural fusion. Yeah. So uh, you know, if there is if, and this question for both of you, Dr. Said and Dr. Christian. A uh, question from the audience: Are there any methods to increase the yield of liquid biopsy, the, uh, Christian? Uh, and then uh, Said, how can we increase the yield of liquid biopsy? You know, for example, if there is a there's timing with the treatment, uh, you know, other, there's yeah. other things. And okay. Dr. Said, you talk about the technical part. So I think the, the, the thing is obviously the time point that we are taking the blood is important and the, the pre-analytical condition that we are using for take this blood if we are doing in-house specifically. You know, we are not speaking about vendors, kind of tubes that you are using. Important that you are not doing, for example, just after chemotherapy or during chemotherapy and during radiation. It's true that when you are doing radiation, for example, you can have an increase of the quantity of free DNA, but maybe it's not the quality of DNA that you are searching for for have this diagnosis because you can have an, a, a lot of background coming from uh, apoptotic cells that are also releasing in the, in the, in the, in the bloodstream uh, other components and can be a confusing factor. Um, but it's important that we have a very careful um, management of the pre-analytical condition. And uh, there is nothing that we can do for increase the free DNA more than be careful how we are collecting. Uh, yeah, and, and Dr. Dr. Said can uh, can attest to our struggle initially, and this was one of the reason of us uh, pushing to do it in house because we struggle a lot on in, in getting yield from outside, sending outside. Dr. Said, what do you what? How do we optimize, uh, uh, you know, the, the liquid biopsy process? Uh, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Cristiano. Pre analytics part is extremely important. We struggled previously because of uh, transportation conditions for some of the samples, especially in Saudi Arabia, where the heat is an issue, especially in summer. Uh, but with strict tubes and changing the transport, the courier uh, instruction to have it in um, four degrees or eight degrees improved a lot the quality of the decirculating DNA. Uh, and sometimes we need, uh, we just, you know, increase the amount of blood that we collect um, from the patients. So uh, sometimes we use two uh, tubes, each one is 10 ml. It's not always easy, especially in frail patients, but this can, can, can increase it. And the of course, uh, the later stages and uh, the bigger the tumor, the more yield we expect on, on, uh, on average. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the last question from the audience, and we'll conclude as uh, one of our colleagues asking, maybe the transformation uh, induced by antimonoclonal directed to EGFR mutation. Do we uh, know the mechanism of transformation, uh, Christian? No, I think it's a very complex situation and it's not directional. There are some uh, hypotheses how it's transforming, but uh, there is still a lot of to, to, to discover. I, I, I think there is not only one cause why. Obviously, we are pushing the, the uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition. We are uh, creating a transformation in the, in the cells itself. So I think it's not only one uh, explanation, but that could be one of the hypotheses. Can I ask one question, last question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yes, um, go ahead. Um, do we have strong evidence that uh, using uh, chemotherapy upfront for patients who are harboring EGFR mutation can affect the expression of mutation? Like for, the, for our patients, for example, we started, we went ahead and started our chemo before uh, receiving the results of NGS. Will that affect the expression of um, EGFR mutation? No, I don't believe so. So taking in consideration that EGFR, so the chemotherapy is still a backbone in, in, uh, in lung cancer, and I don't believe that it's affecting the performance of the 
EGFR later on. Actually, you can have an, a shrinking, and in some patients where you don't have access to the drug, there are some regions in the world that is difficult to have in time the, the treatment, and you need to start whatever you need to start. My suggestion is you are not starting immunotherapy, at least, but you can start chemotherapy because it's not will not affect. Obviously, starting immunotherapy will not help patients with EGFR. We know some data yeah. from uh, yeah. power 150, but uh, uh, certainly it's not affecting, I don't believe. Especially in our region, because we have high percentage, more than third of the patients, yes. actually yeah. more than third of the patients have EGFR, and if you count the others, half of the patients will have other mutations. So I would not start immune therapy blindly and, until I make sure that I have uh, the result of the next gen, sequence, uh, next gen sequencing. And now, once you start the chemo, whether to switch or not uh, quickly, I am uh, advocate of switching as early as possible to the definitive treatment yeah. because, you, you know, the only time I would not switch if patient is having marvelous response and no symptoms, I would give four cycles maximum, and then I would switch to TKI. But I am, especially in our population, because the patient may have complication and you lose them somewhere in, 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 yeah. in the periphery. So I would... That's why this patient we switched quickly when we knew the, the oh, result. Yeah. yeah, I would I would stop here because you know I we take we took two hours from the middle of your day, Christian. I really appreciate oh, you. Don't worry, it's thank a pleasure. And, as always, and, uh, so th thank it's you. always a pleasure having you. And I would like to thank Dr. Nafisa and all our panelists, uh, you know, all the the, the discussant and all the. Um, uh, attendees, thank you very much and have a good night. Have a good day, Christian. Be safe, Take care, I everybody. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.